We've been studying the book of Luke. Yes, we have. And today we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 4. The title of the lesson is simply, The Global Revolution Begins. Remember back at the latter part of Luke chapter 3, the voice of heaven coming from God as Jesus was baptized, which said, This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. And then right immediately following, we find that the good doctor, that evangelist that wanted to heal people's souls, our brother Luke, then gives a genealogy that's very different than the genealogy that Matthew gave. Matthew began his genealogy with Abraham, showing that Jesus was a Jew. However, Luke's purpose was to show that Jesus had come for the salvation of the world. And so he ends his genealogy with the words, and Jesus was the son of Adam, the son of God. And so from this, we find these words in chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. You'd be hungry too. <laughs> and that's the point of the scripture, is to show Jesus' humanity. It's to show Jesus' mortality. And so our first point is the mortal Messiah. You see, to begin this revolution, it takes a leader. And Luke is now going to define who this leader is. The son of Adam, the son of God, the mortal Messiah. You know, it's very interesting. These two verses, you could just preach on and on. But it's very interesting as these two verses serve as kind of the preamble for the temptation, confrontation with Satan himself. And so because of that, Luke chooses to talk about the Holy Spirit two times in this preamble right here. Why? Because he wants to make it clear to the reader, to Theophilus, to the friend of God, that's us, right? Amen, guys? That it wasn't Jesus' fault that he got himself into these temptations, but this was truly of God. Because a lot of times we get ourselves in temptations by messing up and going there in the first place. Thirdly, we find right here that he was tempted for 40 days in the desert. Now, this is very important, these 40 days of fasting. Only two other biblical figures did this. One was Moses in Exodus 34, and the other was Elijah in 1 Kings 19. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. And so Jesus now represents the completion and the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Very interestingly, what Luke is trying to get everybody to see is now there is a new Adam versus the first Adam. The new Adam went into the desert, went into the wilderness. He fasted, and when you fast for 40 days, you get hungry, but you get very weak. This is contrasted to the first Adam who was in the Garden of Eden with everything he could possibly want to eat, except for one tree's fruit. What's the point? Luke wants us to fully understand that in the eyes of God, circumstance is not an excuse for sin. Because Jesus' situation was far more trying he was in the desert. He was in the wilderness. He was weak with hunger. Where Adam was in the Garden of Eden and well fed. And yet Adam failed. The devil said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, 
Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here for it's written. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you'll not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And we certainly understand verse 13. Amen, church? You know, right here, we find the temptations. And it's very interesting in that the order of the temptations here is different than the order in the book of Matthew. And I thought to myself, I said, well, you know, one of these has got to be the chronological ordering. And Jews at this particular time had very little regard for chronological writing or thinking. Whereas we Westerners, we love the timeline. <laughs> so I'm thinking, ah, it's Matthew for literary purposes that switch things around. And probably Luke the Gentile, he's just gone straight with the, with the, the events as they happened. However, after getting into the text and about four commentaries, <laughs> I found that I was probably wrong. First of all, we find that Luke ends the third temptation, curiously, in Jerusalem. But this is one of his main themes because he's trying to build up to this galactic battle that's going to take place in Jerusalem between Jesus and Satan, between good and evil that's going to either save mankind or lose it forever. But the passage that really gives it away is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, where in the third temptation, which is where Jesus is taken to the top of the mountain and viewed in all the world, Jesus then says at the end of that temptation, away from me, Satan! And then the devil leaves him. In Luke's account, these words are omitted. And so it is Luke who uses the literary device of the changing of the temptations. You know, sometimes we look at these temptations and, and they're a little bit vexing even just to kind of look at because we say, well, now hold it. Number one, doesn't Jesus have the right to have provision for all of his needs? Doesn't he have the right as the king of kings to have power over all the nations? Doesn't he have the right for protection by the angels? And so we got to start asking ourselves a couple questions right here. In each of these temptations, Jesus turns to a scripture. Now notice, Satan does too, so Satan can twist the scriptures. But in each of these scriptures, we've got to ask ourselves, which scripture did Jesus use, and why did he use it? Now, interestingly enough, each of the answers that he gives to Satan is from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 8, 3, 6, 13, and 6, 16. Deuteronomy literally means the second law. Well, what, what do we mean by that? Well, really, the book of Deuteronomy, in some ways, is just simply a restatement, a second statement of the divine law that God gave to Moses. And it's written so that God is saying, this is what you must do, men, in order to be righteous before me. So, in rephrasing the temptations from Jesus' point of view, we might look at the first temptation, and Jesus would say, Satan, you suggest feeding my body may take precedence over obeying my God? But God told men, so that's the book of Deuteronomy, but God told men that they should not live by bread alone. Therefore, I shall not do so. See, the issue right here is a very interesting one. Satan was simply saying, hey, turn the stone into bread. Because Jesus was very hungry. He'd been fasting. He was in a dire circumstance. And you know, when we get into tough circumstances and we're weak, we have this voice of Satan behind us saying, hey, where's God in the midst of this? Has God abandoned me? When we get to tough things. And so Jesus had this temptation put him, the temptation to doubt that God's presence was still with him, that God had abandoned him at this point. From Jesus' point of view, the second temptation would be, Satan, 
You offer me universal power at the price to worship you. But God told men, that's the book of Deuteronomy, not to worship anything but him. Therefore, I shall not worship you. Right here, Satan had Jesus look at all the kingdoms, the power, the wealth, the glory, the fame, the sex. And he could have it. Quick and easy. All he had to do was take a knee. That was it. Just take a knee. And it was all his. How simple the world can be to possess. And it was indeed Satan's to give. He was in dominion over the world. In the third temptation, many scholars think that Jesus was taken to the southeast royal porch of the temple itself, where was the largest drop overlooking the Kendron Valley of about 450 feet. And Jesus' point of view would have been, Satan, you propose that I not trust God's promises? But God told men, book of Deuteronomy, not to test him. Now, when you go back and you read that scripture entirety, in Deuteronomy 6.16, it actually says, do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massa. Well, the whole account of Massa, as you will know, is in Exodus chapter 17. This is after they'd come out of Egypt. This is after God had given them manna and food and quail every day. And so what he's really saying right here, he says, Massa means testing. He's saying, you want me to test God by grumbling and complaining? That slavery, being freed from it, and manna having enough to eat every day is not enough? See, a lot of us, we look at grumbling and complaining as kind of minor sins. But in fact, they're sins against the Almighty God. We look upon this dress to an individual. Our husbands or our wives. Our boss. But in essence, it's against our God. And to grumble and to complain after you've come out of slavery of sin... After God has taken care of your every need, is to deny God Himself. You know, there's no question that the first 40 days after you're baptized are tough. You know, Jesus, just think about it, He gets baptized and, whoa, Satan comes at Him. You know, a lot of us have this mindset, oh, man, I'm getting baptized, and now I'm not going to have any more problems. <laughs> you know, it's kind of interesting. I remember getting baptized, and my main cost was standing up and proclaiming Christ at the Sigma Chi fraternity, which I was a brother. I was so afraid. I so wanted to be accepted by everybody in my fraternity. And I remember having to count the cost and, and that night when I got baptized, I got baptized at 1.30 in the morning. I was so sure about standing up for Christ. Literally, less than 12 hours later, I'm at lunch at the fraternity house. And at the fraternity house, you get your regular meal, and then if you're still hungry, you go to the peanut butter and jelly table. And so I was at the peanut butter and jelly table. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this guy comes up. His name's Terry, Terry Demter. He goes, Kip, I heard he got baptized. I swear, I thought it went out to the entire fraternity at that point. I went, Terry. See, I was in the, I just want the relationship kind of slow and easy, does it? Tell people the whole thing, you know? And he goes, I, I heard he got baptized. I couldn't quite read him, but I could tell maybe he was a little bit excited. I said, well, well yeah. He says, tell me about it. So then I got real bold and I told him about it. Two weeks later, I got to baptize my first guy. A week after that, a guy named Randy Jordan was baptized in my fraternity. And a week after that, another one of my fraternity brothers, Chip Hires, was baptized. But you know, when you get baptized, and we've got five people being baptized today, and we've had a ton of people baptized already this year, 
I mean, those first 40 days, Satan's coming at you with everything he's got. And then it really gets tough. <laughs> Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews 2, he's addressing people that have been Christians for years. Years and years and years. And he makes reference back to the life and the strength of Jesus under temptation. In verse 14 of chapter 2, these encouraging words. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not the angel he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he has been made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Is that incredible or not? Yes. Now here's the scripture you've got to underline in red. Chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Amen. See, Jesus had to go through the temptations. And literally the word sympathize in Greek means to suffer along with. He had to go through these temptations and hang strong so that he could become our perfect sacrifice. But the other blessing comes is that now we have an advocate in heaven when we pray that understands what we're going through. And sometimes that's how Satan gets to us, is we get this feeling like nobody understands. Jesus understands. You see, he is the mortal Messiah. Totally human, totally God. You know, one of the great challenges of our day is the recession that we've begun to enter. And as disciples, it's a great challenge for our hearts. Amen. Because if there's anything where disciples wrestle, is how they spend their money. And in the congregation, over the past several months, there's been an incredible generosity. And I really want to commend the church for that. On the other hand, over the last few weeks, the, the, the average giving has gone down. And there can only be two sources of that. Number one is that the young disciples, you're not stepping up yet. And if you're game to be a disciple, then you've got to be game to step up. Amen, guys? Amen. Secondly, the older disciples, you know, sometimes we start feeling all this financial pressure, and the place we go, well, I could just take back a little bit of money so I can make my life a little bit more comfortable. Because no one knows, and truly as the plate is plast, no one knows except God. But what's happening is you're pulling your heart back. You know, we've got to really ask ourselves, are we in the midst of this time of temptation, particularly when it comes to money? Or are we totally sold out in what this is all about? This is not a Sunday morning thing. Luke's trying to explain. He says, this is Jesus, the son of God, the son of Adam who, different than the first Adam, has succeeded in overcoming sin and death, and he is the salvation of both Jew and Gentile, the salvation of the world. Are you with me right here? You know, we have an extra challenge coming on up. We're supposed to register everybody for the Jubilee. And some of us have been more blessed financially than others. I really want to challenge you. Be generous and help some of these poor college students get paid for. Amen, guys? We've got another challenge coming up probably at the end of June. We're going to have our special contributions in order to send out the New York Mission Team. In order to help out the Santiago Church down in South America. The question comes, do you really believe? And the issue is, are you going to sacrifice? Or are you going to give in and take a quick knee? Let's get back to our text. Not only was Jesus the mortal Messiah, but he was a radical revolutionary. Back in Luke 4, 
We read in verses 14 to 15. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Now, for a lot of people, they think this is a directly flowing text, but that would be incorrect. In actuality, the time period between the temptations, verse 13, and verse 14 is three months to a year. You say, well, where, where'd they go? They're recorded for you in the book of John, in chapters 2, 3, and 4. Remember, Luke has already told us now that John is in prison. John the Baptist. But John the Apostle gives us the picture of Jesus' ministry while John is still baptizing and Jesus is still baptizing with his disciples. As a matter of fact, Jesus is out baptizing John. It also shows the picture of the first miracle there at Cana. And so this time period, whether it be three months or a year, that's a bit disputed, is recorded for us in the book of John, and that's called Jesus' Judean ministry. However, Luke chooses to focus in on what we call the Galilean ministry. You say, well, why does he skip the Judean one? Because Luke wants to show that Jesus had more of a purpose than just to come and die for the sins of the world. He actually had a plan in order to get to every human being in the world in a generation. And this plan was unfolded in the Galilean part of his ministry with the selecting of the apostles and so on. And we'll study that in just a few minutes. Let's get back to our text right here. In verse 16, he went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read. Now, there's a little note right here. Interestingly enough, synagogues began during the Babylonian captivity because the temple was destroyed, right? And they were set up very interestingly in that they were set up so that they would face Jerusalem. So that when the people knelt down to pray during the service, they would be praying towards Jerusalem. And in these services, they weren't conducted by Levites or priests, but by any brother that wanted to stand on up and share a scripture and then give a sermon. And so the way that you got recognized is that you were either pre-picked or you stood up. And when you stood up, this was at the point in time when you read the scripture. But when you sat down, you weren't done. That's when you began the sermon. I guess they were prepared for longer sermons back then. I don't know. <laughs> now, given that in mind, let's read this text. Verse 17. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it's written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the singer were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, were amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. So right here, we see that the people are gathered, and the Bible says, and Jesus stood up to read. He's handed the scroll of Isaiah, and he turns to the passage that he wants. It's good to know that Jesus knew his Bible. Amen, church? <laughs> now, some have said that this passage is simply Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. That's true, but there's actually more to it. It not only includes Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, but Isaiah 58, verse 6, that last line, to release the oppressed. And so we find right here, if you would turn to this passage in the book of Isaiah, it would read a little bit different. You say, well, why does it read differently? Because Jesus read out of what's called the Septuagint version. The Septuagint, which is usually notarized by an LXX, which means 70, was the translation from the Hebrew Bible into Greek. This occurred in about 250 B.C. And tradition holds it that there were six people from each of the 12 tribes that were picked. So there were 72 guys. But in actuality, that turned out to be 70 that translated the Bible from Hebrew to Greek. Well, why was this done? Because a lot of the Jews by this time only spoke Greek. They were the Jews of the dispersion. And secondly, 
Jews were evangelistic during this period. Pretty interesting, huh? Now, getting on back here, it's very interesting that Jesus' last words in his quotation of verse 19 is, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And it's said in verse 22, all spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words. Well, why were they so gracious? Because he stopped his reading, and that's the prerogative of every preacher to pick out his text, right? Amen, guys? He stopped his readings from the very last line of Isaiah chapter 61, verse 2, which talked about the fact that the Lord will take vengeance. And everybody goes, wow, that's a gracious preacher. They knew the scriptures, and they knew where Jesus had stopped. Well, it's kind of interesting. He reads it, rolls up the scroll, and actually gives a very short sermon. It says he just sits down, and he began saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Would that have been a cranking service or not? They would have been fired up. And yet the people go, now hold it. How can this guy be so insightful? Now remember, by this time, Jesus is famous. The whole Judean ministry has taken place. People know about Jesus. And then you go, but isn't he Joseph's son? Of course, Luke's making the point, of course he isn't. He's God's son. Now look at this. Verse 23. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. So once more, we have the reference to past miracles. But more interestingly is Luke's choice of remembering a certain part of Jesus' sermon. It was the one about the proverb about the physician. Of course, remember, Luke's a doctor. <laughs> that kind of stuck with him. And the proverb, physician, heal yourself, in our terminology would be simply, you profess it. Now you produce. So in other words, Jesus has just laid out. He says, the spirit of the Lord's on me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recover his sight for the blind, and release the oppressed in your favor. He says, surely you're going to quote this proverb to me. You profess it, now you produce. And then he makes reference in verse 24. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. So he's setting them on upright here. It's a very important line. Because he's saying, I'm not going to be able to produce amongst you. He says, I want to remind you of two occasions in your past. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. He was sent to a Gentile. Israel drifted so far away from God, God could work no miracles there. And so he had to go to the Gentiles during Elisha's time. Wow. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Likewise, a desperate time in the history of Israel... And God could not work any miracles amongst his people because there was no faith. And so God then went to the Gentiles. And so right here becomes the announcement of world, of global revolution. Jesus says, because there will be rejection, I'm not only going to go to the Jews... I am going to the Gentiles. I am going to the whole world to proclaim the good news to the poor. To proclaim freedom for the prisoners. To proclaim recovery of sight for the blind. And to release the oppressed. Now that's an exciting message. Are you with me here, church? Well, let's see how excited they were. Verse 28. All the people in the synagogue were furious. Oh, boy. All, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. Wow. They got up, drove them out of the town, and took them to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw them down a cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. You know, Luke makes notation of this. He doesn't just simply say, and Jesus got away. He says, listen, they took Jesus out of the synagogue. 
They took him to the brow of the hill to kill him. And seemingly there is no element of the miraculous here. But Jesus just stood his ground and said, excuse me, I've got some things to do. <laughs> Luke's point, no man will kill Jesus. Jesus will only die when he's decided to lay down his own life. You know, it astounds me in our day and age how little the faith is about what our God can do. We believe that Jesus Christ came into the world and died for the sins of the whole world. This was the plan of God before creation itself. I mean, let's just lay it out. God did a little bit of thinking on this thing. Now, if God said, I am sending my one and only son to die for the sins of the world, don't you think he'd have a plan so that everybody'd have a chance to hear that message? That's what Luke writes about. I'll trust your Bible knowledge. A few chapters later in chapter 6, Jesus calls together all of his disciples and selects 12. The sign of the new kingdom versus the 12 sons of Jacob would now be the 12 apostles. The Bible says he would pour his life into these men so that he would send them out to preach. In Luke chapter 10, he calls together 72 more into his service to preach the word. And of course, the number's not by chance right here. Jesus always paired up the apostles and all the disciples. And when you pair up the apostles, there are six pairs. Six pairs into 72 people means that each pair of apostles got 12 guys to oversee. Jesus was simply reproducing his ministry in them. In Luke chapter 24... In verse 45, he tells them, you are going to go to all nations. And remember, the book of Acts is just simply Luke, part two. He says in Acts chapter one, verse eight, he says, you're going to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. He's speaking to the apostles right here. And then it notes in Acts one and verse 15 that this point there were simply 120 followers of Jesus. That's the 11 faithful apostles, the 72, Jesus' mother, his brothers, and the women that supported him. That's the core group that Jesus had. Then, of course, the explosion on the day of Pentecost comes, and 3,000 are baptized into Christ. But now... Luke lays out some principles about how the early church got the word proclaimed everywhere. Turn to Acts chapter 5. In Acts 5 and verse 41 it says, The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they have been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts, from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. What's he saying right here? Is Christ was proclaimed every day. Go to Acts chapter 8. Verse 4. Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. What's the principle he lays on out? Is that every single disciple, every one, preached every day. Go to Acts chapter 28. At the very end, he draws his conclusion. Paul's meeting with some skeptical Jews. And we read in verse 21 of chapter 28. He's in Rome now. They replied, We've not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from there reported or said anything about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. Everywhere. 
See, this was the goal of Jesus, to proclaim the good news every day, every disciple, everywhere. Let me ask you, does that describe your life? You call yourself a disciple. You call yourself a follower of Jesus. Then every day, every disciple needs to preach everywhere. Got to ask yourself a question. Do you have visitor church this week? Visitor Bible talk? Not from time to time. We all don't have one. Amen. I'm talking about was it your heart to have one? Every day, every disciple, everywhere. You know, I appreciate Chris Freckman's words up here as he's placing membership. And, and just the heart of this man. He said, we were spiritually normatic. That means you wandered around a lot. <laughs> Jesus' disciples were never spiritually normatic. They had a purpose. They had a goal. They had an end. It was the end of the world. They were to get the message out. Everyone. Everywhere. You know, this past Friday night was one of the highlights of this year for me. Elaine and I were able to attend the Campus Teen Devo. Yeah. And uh, it was an incredible time. Big Junior planned it on out. And we had all the the campus young people, and, and, and Hugo, one of our teens, that have been baptized in the first two months of this year. We had about 14 people stand up and share. What was it that really got them to make the decision to become disciples? And, you know, each person's story was just so fascinating. I mean, Melissa talking about her, her Buddhist background. That was, that was incredible. And... Then talking about the fact that she knew Esther wasn't a Christian, even though Esther claimed to be one. <laughs> and, and it's interesting. These people are full of faith. And then, on top of that, Vic then had the four college students that are going to be baptized today then share. It was, I, was, I was in tears. It was incredible. Because these people, they realized their lives were changed. They're never, never, never going to be the same. And there was a passion. You just feel it. There was an energy in that room. They weren't spiritual or nomadic. They want to take that message to their campus, Amen. to this city, to this nation, and to this lost world. Are you with me right here? Yeah. You know, we, we've got to get a conviction, church. No matter what people say. Because Luke makes it clear. Jesus was a radical revolutionary. And if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you've got to be radical and you've got to be a revolutionary. People may be saying, oh, we don't need to take the message around the world in a generation. But where's the heart behind that? I mean, it's, it's, it's staggering. Come on, Skip, talk about it. Yep. We sit around. We look at Nike and McDonald's and Coca-Cola. All of these name brands have taken their message around the world. Now, there has been some misunderstanding. Some people think to take the message to every creature under heaven means that everybody becomes a Christian. That ain't going to happen. But you know something? You go any place in the world, and you'll find people wearing Nike shoes but you'll find everybody knowing about Nike. You go everywhere in the world, and you'll see McDonald's stores, but not everybody's eating a Big Mac, but they know about it. You're all around the world, and I still remember being in San Pedro Sula. On the top of the mountain that overlooks their whole city is Coca-Cola. You know, we got the Hollywood sign. They got Coca-Cola. Not everybody there drinks it. They can't even afford it. But everybody knows about Coca-Cola. As disciples, 
We've got to have the heart to do whatever it takes to take this message into the whole world Amen. in a generation. Amen, church? Yeah. And if by chance you've not been in a study lately, then I'll guarantee the fires of your heart have started to die down. Because you see, evangelism, yes, it was meant to bring our lost friends to Christ. But evangelism was meant to keep our fire stoked and fired up and revolutionary. Amen? Our last point is that Jesus was a lonely liberator. Let's go back to Luke chapter 4. Beginning in verse 31. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What is this teaching? With authority and power, he gives orders to evil spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the whole surrounding area. Is that incredible right here? Now, interestingly enough, the real miracle here was twofold. Yes, part of the miracle was Jesus casting out the demon. But the other part of the miracle was, the simple notation, is that it came out without injuring him. And the Dr. Luke, he would have noticed that, don't you think? <laughs> See, demons are destructive. And they're coming after you. They're coming after you. Some people ask, well, why didn't Jesus want the demons to go talk about that he was the Christ? Because the Jews believed that the demons could not tell the truth. And so Jesus didn't want demons to go on out and say, he's the Christ, he's the Christ. Because they go, oh, no, he's not the Christ. He says, just shut up. <laughs> but you know, the thing that fascinates me right here is the fact that they saw something different about the preaching of Jesus. He preached as one with authority. Does that mean that he talked real loud? Does that mean he had a really deep voice? <laughs> what did it mean? It meant that Jesus expected obedience to the word of God. He expected that when people heard the word, he expected them to change. Now, I'll never forget the true story of Abraham Lincoln going to church with uh, one of his uh, Secret Service agents. And they went to go hear one of the most renowned preachers of that day, a guy named Dr. Gurley. Now, it's a real story, so you've got to go with the guy's name. <laughs> they come out of the church, and the Secret Service agent goes, well, Mr. President, what did you think? Abraham Lincoln said, articulate, thought-provoking, powerfully delivered, but it failed. And Secret Service is, failed? It failed to ask something great of me. This is the failure of the pulpit around the United States. It's the failure to call people to obey the word of God and to live as Jesus lived. That's the preaching of Jesus. He was a liberator because he called people to obey the word of God. Let's go to our closing section. Verse 38. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. Aha, we got the good doctor in the house, don't we? Shh. Wasn't just a fever, it's a high fever. <laughs> Secondly, 
There are some groups that believe that Peter was the Pope and was single. You can't do that with a mother-in-law. Let's back it up again, verse 38. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. So he's been preaching. He goes to Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. And they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Remember, this is the good doctor. Remember our Greek word, sozo. It means to heal and to save. This woman was healed. And immediately she begins to serve. When we are healed, when we are saved, when we are baptized, it's time for us to start giving back. It's time for serve. The person who gets baptized and then doesn't start to serve will eventually find his heart falling away. Because the disciple is one who serves and gives himself. Verse 40. When the sun was setting, now this is important because it was the Sabbath. So the Sabbath is going to be ending, and now Jesus can go to work. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses. And he laid his hands on each one of them, and he healed them. Notice the two passages right here. There's a very great distinction that Luke himself draws between demon possession and sickness. Secondly, we see that when Jesus was done preaching, after he'd healed Simon's mother-in-law, the Bible says... The people of the town start bringing all sorts of other people who are sick, and he lays his hand on each one. Jesus always had the personal touch. 41. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You're the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when he came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Now, right here, we get an incredible insight. Luke believes that when we read this, we understand why Jesus went to a solitary place. But let's look at his original text that he drew from. Look at Mark, chapter 1. In verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. See, Jesus got up even during daylight saving time, Sunday. <laughs> got up while it was still dark. And had his time with God. You know, we've got to ask ourselves. Do we have our solitary place where we get with our God? This was the most powerful man that ever lived. And yet every morning. He got up. And inferred right here. Every morning before it was light. Why? When the light came on and the rest of the world got up, including the kids, there was just too much to do. You know, Jesus, remember he was at the Sabbath and he preached. Then, after the sun goes down, he's healing all these people. Luke later notes that when he heals the woman with an issue of blood, he says, who touched me? Because I felt the power go out of me. Each healing took power out of Jesus. And we understand, understand that because when we study with someone, we wrestle with them. We so badly want them to become fellow disciples. I mean, you get done with the study, you go, Whoa. I felt the power go out. As a matter of fact, some people are afraid to stay up late. And give people the personal touch. Other people go, I'm just so tired. I need my extra sleep. If you're so tired, then you need to get up early and get straight from God. Notice Jesus says, listen, I can't hang around here any longer to continue the healing. 
Because that's not why I've come. I have come to preach the good news of the kingdom. Jesus was not about a social gospel. Jesus was about proclaiming the kingdom and saving souls. The healing was to produce faith so people would become disciples. You know, at the Campus Devo, it really was one of those I'm not going to forget. All those young people sharing about becoming disciples. One of them came up to me. He said, bro, how long have you been a disciple? And I said, hold on just a second, I got to compute it. <laughs> I said, well, come April 11th, I'll be 36 years old. Wow. Hey, that's what they did. Oh. <laughs> and the question came, how did you stay faithful for so long? <laughs> You know, it's a very interesting thing. People think there's going to be this, like, deep, incredible, galactic, unbelievable revelation bestowed upon them. <laughs> I said, I, it, it's simple. I get up every morning, often before it's light. I go to a solitary place. I open my Bible. I pray. Amen, bro. <laughs> it seems so simple. And yet, Jesus needed that time with God just to make it through the day. His ministry would last three years. And then there would be a day that not only would he be in a solitary place, he would be the solitary person who still held the dream while everybody else slept. These days were preparing him for his Gethsemane. Oh, the first 40 days? Mm, Satan will come after you. And then it gets hard. Because if you walk as Jesus walked, if you preach as Jesus preached, if you dreamed as Jesus dreamed, each day was building upon another to be able to see a global revolution. See, Jesus believed when no one else did. And in that last moment when Satan tried to stop him from the cross, it was Jesus who prayed, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And the will of God is a global revolution where every person in this generation hears of Jesus Christ, the Son of Adam, the Son of God.